Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Carol Werner. I'm the Executive Director of the Environmental and Energy Study Institute, and I am so glad that you are here to join us this afternoon for our briefing on public attitudes about climate change and clean energy. I think this comes at a very propitious moment in our history, uh, particularly as we are acutely aware of all of the attention that climate has been receiving in the last few weeks and with the ratification of the climate, uh, the Paris Climate Agreement uh, that has happened just this last week uh, by reaching two thresholds that were critical for the ability of that agreement to enter into force. Uh, those two thresholds were that more than 55 countries representing more than 55 percent of global greenhouse emissions uh, needed to uh, deposit their instruments of ratification with the United Nations. That has occurred. This is a record-setting achievement for an international agreement, meaning that that Paris Climate Agreement will enter into force uh, in November. So this is a very, very important time in terms of thinking about how the world is perceiving climate change and the urgency with which it needs to be addressed. And of course, dealing with that comes all sorts of issues in terms of thinking about what affects climate change, what are the roles of energy, how do we deal with other issues that uh, have been raised by so many practitioners around the world, including how do we become more resilient in terms of our communities, how do we deal with adaptation, uh, as we see more and more things happen that are uh, uh, are related to extreme weather events. And the list goes on and on. At the same time, it's really important from a policy perspective and from a policymaker perspective, in, indeed, to think about what what are the attitudes, what are the views, how is this issue and its related components being received, being perceived by people across the country, by the American public. And so we are delighted this afternoon to have someone who is spending so much of his time trying to help us all better understand public attitudes with regard to climate change and clean energy with us this afternoon. So we will be hearing from Professor Ed Maybach, who is, uh, Dr. Maybach is the, uh, uh, the, how do I wanna say this? He, he is a distinguished university professor at George Mason University. He is also the founding director of the George Mason University Center of Climate Change Communication. His research, as I mentioned, focuses on public understanding of climate change. He also, during the three-year period of 2011 through 14, was the co-chair of the Engagement and Communication Working Group for the third National Climate Assessment. And he is engaged in working with many different groups and other universities, including Yale, uh, Yale's uh, uh, polling and public opinion uh, school with regard to various climate change public engagement and, and public understanding. So at this time, I am very honored to turn the podium over to Dr. Ed Maybach. Thank you, Carol, and thank you all for coming this afternoon to share a few minutes with me. I realize you, uh, it's a slow day here at the Capitol, but you all have good things to do, good, good ways to spend your time, so I'm going to try to make sure this was one of the best ways you could spend that time. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about what we know, what we've been learning from our polling projects, uh, but I want to start by cert acknowledging that with regard to climate change and clean energy, um, there are a lot of matters of opinion. Um, and we are all entitled to our own opinion, but there are also certain matters of fact. Um, and it isn't helpful when, when in a uh, 
In a democracy, people hold different sets of facts. So all of the polling work that we do begins with some common facts. Um, most, sort of most basically, this first and, and most important finding from the National Climate Assessment, um, which essentially says that human-caused climate change is happening, um, its impacts are being felt around the United States, um, and the human, uh, the human attribute, or the human causality, the human fingerprint associated with climate change is as a result of the burning of, primarily as a result of the burning of fossil fuels. So that sort of is the, the, the at the most simple level, the basis in fact. Lots of, uh, lots of opinions about those facts, um, lots of facts about, about opinions about what we should do about uh, these facts, but that's what we try to get at through our polling work. So when I use a plural pronoun, our, I'm talking about my team at Yale and George Mason University. Um, it's a large group that has changed over time. We're gonna, I'm gonna be sharing data that we've been collecting since 2008 so that the team of people has, has changed over time, but do want to acknowledge that this, what I'll be sharing with you comes exclusively from the Yale and Mason polling group. Um, everything that I, I believe that everything I'm going to share is more or less consistent with what other polling teams both in the commercial sector as well as in the academic sector are finding. So I'm not going to sort of sh show you any one-offs that, that don't have the basis in confirmation of other teams. So I'm going to make three points today. The first point is that the good news is that uh, most Americans are convinced that global warming is real, but then they're shortly thereafter follow a whole bunch of caveats. Um, so the good news is, is heavily caveated. The, the second uh, point is also good news, and that is if I'm reading our data correctly, the times they are a change in public opinion, public understanding of climate change is in a fairly dynamic period of flux right now. Whether or not it's a long-term trend versus just a blip, we, we won't yet know. Um, time will tell. Um, and then the third point that I'd like to make is that public support this is something of a paradox, but public support for clean energy and climate action actually outpaces public understanding of climate change as a risk. So even though much of what I'm going to share with you shows that the public has a very weak understanding of, of the extent of the risk, um, they have a very strong sense of the fact that we ought to be taking action. Um, and the reasons for doing so, as I'll show you in a few minutes, go beyond simply um, our feelings and our concern about climate change and, and get to some other more fundamental beliefs. So the first point, um, most Americans are convinced that climate change is happening. This is the, the data that I would put up to uh, support that. Seven out of ten Americans think that global warming is happening. There's been a bit of waxing and waning over the, uh, over the past decade in that belief. Um, I could sort of tell you why I think there has been waxing and waning at different points over the past decade. It doesn't really, it's not all that important. Um, I will, however, say that I think that all, um, while we're at the high watermark of public understanding currently, um, we're, we are meeting, once again, meeting the high watermark that we first saw in, in 2008 when we began our polling project. Um, my sense is that public attitudes, public opinions, are more stable now than they were in 2008. In other words, I don't expect to see this degree of waxing and waning going forward. So an import, the, the first important caveat that you have to understand about the fact that 70% of the public is convinced that climate change is real is that many members of the public are uncertain. They don't, only four out of 10 are either very or extremely certain that global warming is happening. Um, about one out of 20, less than one out of 10 at least, um, are very sure that global warming is not happening, um, which means that the remaining 50% have, are only somewhat certain of their views or they don't have views at all. They tell us they don't know. Their answer to this question is, I don't know. So that means half of America has relatively um, weak views on, on this issue. While seven out of 10 people are convinced, only five out of 10 are convinced that, human that the climate change is human caused. So we lose a substantial proportion of Americans who, who are paying enough attention to be convinced that it's real, but are not paying enough attention or, or are not convinced by what evidence is put in front of them that climate change is being caused by human action. 
um, while f the vast majority of climate scientists, somewhere between 97 and 99 percent, depending on how you, how you study the uh, experts' opinions about climate change, the vast majority of climate scientists are convinced that human-caused climate change is happening, except, unfortunately, only about one out of ten Americans understands that there is a consensus, a scientific consensus among the experts about human-caused climate change. Um, that 10 percent is the, the one group over here on your right, uh, 11 percent actually. Um, the most common answer uh, to our question is, you know, what, what do you think? How, what proportion of climate scientists are convinced that human-caused climate change is happening? The most common answer is, I don't know. So that's about one out of three people. Um, and as you can see, there's a fairly uh, consistent distribution all the way down to less than 50 percent. Um, this is not an accident. This is, this is the product of a, a very smart, very sustained strategic communication campaign to convince Americans that there is a lot of disagreement among the experts. Um, and as it turns out, as I will show you momentarily, it was a very smart campaign because this belief is really fundamental in public understanding of human-caused climate change because climate change is complicated and if we think the experts aren't convinced, why should we be convinced? Um, most Americans see global warming not in the way that the National Climate Assessment has talked about it, not as climate change is a here and now problem that is having impacts across America today, but they see it as a distant threat. Um, it's distant in space, so they see it as primarily happening somewhere else, not here. Um, that, and that somewhere else that's, is light, uh, is for most people somewhere beyond America's borders. Um, it's seen as distant in time. It's a, it's a future problem. It's not today's problem. And it's seen as distant in, uh, in terms of species. It's seen largely as harming plants, penguins, and polar bears and ice, um, not so much in terms of it harming people. So this, there's this really significant psychological distance that most Americans experience when they think about climate change. The majority of Americans, 58 percent currently, tell us they're worried about climate change, but only uh, of those, only 16 percent say they're very worried about it. So that means they're worried about it in a, I believe it means they're worried about it in an abstract sense as a, as a problem that will have to be dealt with, um, but it's not a pressing problem, it's not today's problem, it's not on my top priority list of pro problems. Um, the fact that 16 percent of the public, and you'll, I think you'll understand who that 16 percent is in a few minutes when I show you the distribution of um, the, the six global warming six Americas, uh, that, that really is the 16 percent who are very worried about it. For all other Americans, it's a, a much lesser worry. Now, this slide is really hard to read, even if it's in front of you, much less if you're away from it, so let me walk you through it. Um, we ask a question that tries to get at people's sense of what is the most likely outcome. Are we, as a people, going to rally to deal with this problem, or are we, as the President likes to say, are we going to kick the can down the road? Um, so we ask the question, which, which of the following statements comes closest to your view? I'm going to walk you up the slide with the response categories, so from least prevalent answers to, to the most prevalent answer. The least prevalent answer is that humans can reduce global warming and we're going to do so successfully. In other words, we've got this. And it's only one out of 20 Americans who, who believe that this is something that is not only within our capability, but we're going to do this. That's a, a little bit distressing. Um, at a whole lot of different levels. The next most common response is that global warming isn't happening. That's about 8 percent. Um, next most common is that humans can't reduce global warming even if it is happening. It's sort of a more lukewarm version of doubting that climate change is our problem. Um, the next most common response held by a quarter of our respondents is that humans could reduce global warming, but people aren't willing to change their behavior, so we're not going to. A, an overtly fatalistic point of view. Um, and the most common response, almost half the public says that humans can reduce, could reduce global warming, but it's unclear at this point whether we're going to do what's necessary. In other words, the jury's still out 
that is not an unreasonable point of view. It's not a great, uh, <laughs> it, it's not an optimistic point of view in the sense that if, if this is a problem that our nation should be addressing, we want more people to feel like we've got this and I'm going to roll up my sleeves and be part of the solution. Um, yet this, isn't, this is where we are today. Fewer than four out of ten Americans think that the American people can convince our Congress um, to pass ambitious legislation to reduce global warming. If our Congress is here to do the will of the people, um, one would expect, one might expect it to be a higher proportion of Americans who think that they can convince Congress to do their will. Um, in, in terms of uh, sort of psychological jargon, this is called collective efficacy. Um, I would suggest that we as the American people have relatively low sense of collective efficacy that we are able to convince the decision makers to do the right thing. Um, the next couple of slides actually come from a report that we released last week. Um, in that report we called the question, is there a climate spiral of silence in America? Um, and our preliminary answer is yes, it looks like there is. Um, we know from our polling data that, that two out of three people tell us they're interested in, in this issue. Um, they want to learn more about this issue. Also, two out of three Americans tell us that they, are, that they find this issue to be personally relevant. So essentially, you get concurrence between those two numbers. About two out of three of us think this is a relevant issue, both in general uh, as well as personally. Yet, unfortunately, fewer than half of Americans tell us that they're hearing about this issue in the media. And by in the media, I mean in the news, television, newspapers, digital, um, and in entertainment media. So um, it's really, it is absolutely manifestly true. This is not my research, but other people like me do research tracking media coverage of climate change. Um, media coverage of climate change hit the high water mark in 2007, around the time when Mr. Gore and the IPCC won their Nobel Prize for addressing, uh, for their work to address climate change. The coverage of climate change has plummeted quite dramatically after that. So in the intervening years, there was like 75% less coverage in newspapers around the nation, 80% um, less coverage on the, the nightly news. It has bounced back some, but it's still considerably less than in what it was at, in 2007. All of that notwithstanding, I think there's still something going on here where the public is not noticing what coverage of climate change is actually going on in, in the media. But more concerning to me, because of this notion of a climate silence is that less than two out of ten Americans hear people that they know talking about this issue once a month or more frequently. Two out of ten people. That means for the other eight out of ten of us, we hear about it less than once a month. Most people, four out of ten, actually hear about it once a year at most. And and finally, only three out of 10 Americans tell us that they discuss global warming with their friends and family, the people who it is most okay to have uncomfortable conversations with. So the reason we're concerned about the climate silence and the reason we think actions probably ought to be taken to try to stimulate more conversation about climate change in America is because issues um, the prominence, the salience of issues is sort of directly proportional to how much attention it gets out there in the public dialogue. If people aren't hearing it, if they're not hearing those conversations in the media, in, their convers in conversations among people they know, and if they're not participating in those conversations, it tends to reinforce the belief that this, while this is indeed a problem, it's tomorrow's problem or next year's problem. It isn't really today's problem. So that was the good news with all the caveats. Um, what comes next is what I hope is unvarnished good news, no caveats needed. Um, but as I said, these are, um, what I'm about to show you are sort of changes that we've seen over the past two years. So it's, it's possible this is the beginning of a trend or a variety of different trends. It's also possible that this is what pollsters might call a blip, a temporary fluctuation up and it, it might come back down. <laughs> 
So the most basic question we ask in our surveys is whether or not you believe, our respondents believe that global warming is happening. Um, we've seen a fairly large increase in among everybody in that over the past two years, but the most important increase that we've seen is the one here on the extreme right-hand side of the slide. We've seen that among conservative Republicans, there has been a 19 percentage point increase in the proportion who say global warming is happening. In the public opinion polling business, a 19 percent change in two years is, is really quite large. Um, so we, I, I'm, I'm hopeful that this is the beginning of a, a long-term and sustained trend, um, but perhaps too soon to say. Um, one, an, uh, an, a perception that we have been tracking for a long time now, since our first survey, is whether or not people believe that Americans are being harmed already as a result of global warming. Um, and as you can see, we're, we're now at the new high water mark. Only, it's still only more, about slightly more than one out of three, um, but that is a sort of the product of a long-term gradual increase. Um, there are lots of good organizations who are working very hard to communicate the fact that Americans are being harmed by climate change already, um, but it's only slowly beginning to sink in. Last, a year ago last summer, June 18th, um, the, unfortunately the day after Dylan Roof murdered many people in a church in South Carolina, um, the Pope released his encyclical on global warming called Laudato Si. Uh, it's a very, very powerful statement that opens up a new lens, a new, uh, a new window on the problem of climate change. The Pope talked about climate change primarily as a moral issue an issue that is moral as a result of the fact that the people around the world who have benefited most from the fossil fuel era um, are least likely to be harmed by global warming and the people who have been harmed least by the fossil fuel era are being hurt first and worst by global warming. So he fundamentally asked people of faith around the world to see this as the issue that it is, a moral issue, and, and respond to that by taking appropriate action. The reason why we think that was such an important um, event in terms of beginning to end the climate silence, potentially, begin to start a new kind of conversation in America, is because Americans do see, understand global warming as a variety of different kinds of issues, but we mostly see it as an environmental issue, which by default means it's an issue that many Americans don't really think is their issue. Um, we see it secondarily as a scientific issue. Um, scientific issues are interesting to those of us who are science nerds, but for most people it's not terribly engaging. Um, we do are beginning to see it more as a food issue, an agricultural issue, and, and that's really good because it certainly is that. Um, we're beginning to see it as a weather issue, uh, and a severe weather issue. Um, and to a much greater, uh, lesser degree, we're beginning to understand it as a health issue. But very few Americans currently, this is actually our most recent data, very few Americans even today see it as a moral issue, um, a poverty issue or a social justice issue. And those are precisely the types of issues that, that Pope Francis um, taught us or spoke about in, in his teachings. These, the next two slides are a little bit difficult to, to follow. I'll simply say that we surveyed a, 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 a random group of Americans between spring and fall of 2015. Um, we did so specifically to assess the impact that, uh, that Pope Francis's encyclical was going to have. Um, we anticipated we would see a, the biggest impact on Catholics and a lesser impact on other Americans. Um, in fact, we saw a fairly substantial impact on Catholics, but we also saw a fairly substantial impact on Americans overall. And in some cases, ca uh, the impact on Catholics' understanding of climate change really was no greater than, than the all of us. Um, the ways, sort of three ways that I'd like to uh, just briefly characterize, three impacts that we call the Francis effect. Um, it really did, his teachings really did begin to increase people's understanding of global warming as a moral issue, a social justice or fairness issue, um, and even though he didn't really frame it in these terms, a, a spiritual and a religious issue. Um, 
his teachings had a, a significant impact on helping Americans understand that the world's poor were going to be hurt first and worst, which is why it is a moral issue. And then, oh, I'm sorry, and that was it. I pulled a slide. Um, so the point being, and the reason why I think this is this warrants comment in the times they are a changing, um, because while the Pope, I'm not sure the Pope has finished his portion of the conversation about climate change, I can tell you that the American Catholic Church, his emissaries here in the United States are working very hard to continue that conversation in Catholic churches around the country. Lots of other faith denominations are also looking to start or continue that conversation in lots of churches and synagogues around the country. So this is an important new voice that, that previously really had not been um, nearly as active as they are becoming. So the last point I wanted to, to flag for you um, that I think is positive is that we know that three out of 10 Americans tell us that they'd be willing to join a campaign to convince elected officials to take action to reduce global warming. What exactly people think that means, we don't know. Um, we, uh, we wrote the question to essentially ask, would you be willing to link arms with fellow citizens and, and try to make your concerns understood by our elected officials, by our business officials, et cetera? Um, three out of 10, let's just say that's about 90 million Americans. Um, I can tell you that the, the membership of all the environmental groups in America combined does not add up to 90 million. Um, so the reason why I think this is quite a positive sign is that there are a lot of Americans out there who tell us they care enough to get involved, they just aren't involved yet. Um, philanthropy researchers, when they survey people and ask people why they didn't help, um, the most common answer across lots and lots and lots of studies is because they say, nobody asked me to help. So I see a lot of opportunity to ask 90 million Americans to help. So let me move to the third and final point that I wanted to make, which is, um, as I called it a paradox, the fact that their public support for climate action and moving forward with a uh, sort of pivoting away from fossil fuels and, and, and heading directly into the clean energy era is a lot stronger than public understanding of, of climate change. For me, this is an incredibly re revealing slide. Um, it shows that, that most Americans, uh, most of this is voters, this is not all members of the public, but most American voters want corporations, Congress, local, state, and local government officials, and citizens themselves to do more to address global warming. And if you look across the rows, so you can see that, that uh, corporations and industry, we particularly expect them to step up. Um, and by we, I mean Democrats, independents, and Republicans. Um, we expect citizens themselves to step up. Um, and again, you still see the majority of, uh, the large majority of Democrats, uh, uh, independents, and a small majority of Republicans. Um, and with the exception of Republicans, we expect US Congress to step up, our member of Congress to step up, our governors, our local officials um, to step up to the plate. And that's a really interesting insight as far as I'm concerned. Um, it's not that we expect one sector of our society to respond, we expect all sectors of our society to respond. Um, and I think the implication of this is that for those of you who are trying to mo uh, mobilize support for policy responses, don't forget that the public feels even more strongly about corporate responses and about citizenry responses. So if you're too narrow-minded in terms of the kind of response you're looking to promote, um, you may well be losing some of the enthusiasm that members of the public have for the fact that we need to see lots of actors in our society step up. So why is that, or why might that be? <coughs> um, more than half of Americans tell us um, in response to our question that if our nation takes steps to reduce global warming, what will happen? A fairly large majority of Americans say it will create a better life for our children and grandchildren, and almost no one says it won't do that. A significant majority says it will improve our health, and almost no one says it won't do that. 
So those are two really strong manifest goods that, the pub that we all care about a lot, leaving a legacy, creating a better life for our children and grandchildren, improving conditions so that we, our children, our parents, all of us can live more healthfully today. Those are really strong reasons for dealing with this problem, and those are reasons that the public already embraces. They already see those things as happening if we, take, if we respond to this problem. Um, I'd point your attention about halfway down to the fact that about half of our respondents say um, responding to global warming will cause energy prices to rise. So that's about half think that's true. Very few think that isn't true, about 11%. Um, and I would suggest that's really a matter of, um, that is a outdated understanding. I am not an economist. I'm not prepared to make an economic argument to you, but I'm really impressed at how quickly the economics of clean energy are changing, um, even without a price on emitting heat trapping pollution into the atmosphere. So um, it's really important that most Americans think that with the good will come some bad. Um, and if that isn't true, if those economics are based on outdated assumptions, I think we have an opportunity to set the record straight on that important point. So I don't want to mislead you into thinking that anybody makes global warming their top tier voting issue. Liberal Democrats, it gets pretty close to the top tier. It's, it's number six. Um, moderate and conservative Democrats, it's, it's number 13 as a voting issue. Um, for moderate Republicans, it's way down there at number 21, and for conservative Republicans, it's, it's dead last, which probably means if we had more items on the list, it would still drop to dead last. So let's be clear, this isn't a top-tier voting issue for very many Americans. That notwithstanding, and we have looked at this on three different surveys now, our three most recent surveys, what we find when we ask people um, the following question, if a candidate for U.S. president strongly supports taking climate action to reduce global warming, would you be more or less likely to vote for that candidate? And what we find is that by a three to one margin, Americans tell, voters, American voters tell us, yes, I'd be more likely to vote for that candidate who supports strong action on climate change. And then we turn the question around 180 degrees and we say, would you be more or less likely to vote for a candidate who opposes action on climate change? And by a four to one margin, people tell us they'd be less likely to vote for such a candidate. I don't know to what degree this has bearing on the current presidential election, but I do have a growing sense that this does have bearing in our elections going forward. Um, the fact that by a you know, three to or four to one margin, people are becoming increasingly uncomfortable with candidates who aren't willing to step up and do more. So the, the law of the land right now, even if it is sort of in abeyance, uh, um, is the Clean Power Plan. Um, we, do our, we assume that very few Americans have heard of the Clean Power Plan, so we do our best to write a simple uh, plain language description of it. Um, we say, how much do you support or oppose the following policy? Uh, setting strict carbon dioxide emission limits on existing coal-fired power plants to reduce global warming and improve public health. Power plants would have to reduce their emissions and or invest in renewable energy and energy efficiency. The cost of electricity to consumers and companies would likely increase. So you see that even us in our polling questions, we have some possibly outdated economic assumptions. But that notwithstanding, this is the degree to which the public supports the Clean Power Plan stated in simple terms. 70% of all of us do, 91% um, of liberal Democrats, 85% of moderate Democrats, 67% of moderate Republicans. It's really a surprising level of support for the fundamental proposition that is embodied in the Clean Power Plan. Um, and and uh, hopefully this is now irrelevant. Um, as Carol said, the, the Paris Agreement has now been put in force. Um, but that notwithstanding, most Americans feel we should be taking these actions regardless of what other nations do, which is a really strong statement. 
Um, I so often hear the reason we shouldn't be responding to climate change is because India and China won't. And thus, that would mean if we did, we'd just be the suckers who were putting our cash on the table. Um, in reality, that has now been shown not to be true, but even if it were true, we know that a majority of Americans feel like we should be doing the right thing regardless. This is my final policy slide. Um, it's a little bit dense, but let's just take a look at the numbers, uh, these policies as, as from top to bottom. So we ask people um, how much would they support or oppose funding more research into renewable energy sources such as solar and wind power. And you can see that across the political spectrum, we get strong, strong support for federal R&D into clean energy. Um, support for providing tax rebates for people who purchase energy efficient vehicles or solar panels. So helping ordinary people and presumably companies um, take the steps that are available to them today. Again, you see strong support up to and including conservative Republicans for that proposition. Regulating carbon dioxide, the primary greenhouse, greenhouse gas as a pollutant, um, you even see the majority of conservative Republicans in support of that. It is a slim majority. Um, and after that, things fall down just a bit, but I'll, I'll just point you to the next one uh, in the list, requiring fossil fuel companies to pay a carbon tax and use the money to reduce other taxes by an equal amount, revenue neutral carbon tax. Um, as you can see, all the way through moderate Republicans, you get strong support. We, we lose conservative Republicans from that proposition. Just a word about that I sort of prefaced earlier. Um, we've, in our survey work, we've uh, identified six distinct views out there among, in the public about global warming. We call the people who hold those views global warming six Americas. Um, on one end, you get the alarmed. Uh, six, I said 16% of Americans are very worried about global warming and 17% are alarmed. So it's the alarmed who are very worried. On the other end of this continuum, you have a, a sort of an equal and opposite group. Um, we call them the dismissive, about 10% currently, um, and, and shrinking somewhat over the past few years. Um, they feel very strongly that this issue isn't real. If it is real, it isn't human caused, and even if it is human caused, it's certainly not serious and does not warrant a public response. If you are a campaigner, a climate campaigner, on either side of this issue, you're almost certainly going after one of these two audiences. These are the two groups of people who are going to be willing to take action. If you are trying to help Americans understand this issue better, under the assumption that this is real, this is serious, um, and all of us have decisions to make, whether those are personal decisions about how we run our lives or public decisions about the, the people we put in elected office or the policies that they promulgate. We have important decisions to make, and these are the people that we need to reach in order to help them understand climate change in a manner that is more consistent with the, the actual climate science. In our research, we found that lots of different beliefs are associated with various what I call appropriate attitudes and behaviors. Those appropriate attitudes, I realize I'm making a value judgment here, but uh, with that stated clearly, um, I think it is appropriate to have the attitude that we should be responding as a society to this problem. I think it's appropriate to, to support specific policies that will help us deal with the problem. And I think appropriate behaviors, there are sort of two broad categories. We can we can use our voice as citizens by engaging with our elected officials. Um, we can use our voice as consumers by choosing how to spend our money, with whom and where to spend our money. I think all of these are appropriate responses. We find that there's at least five key beliefs that are strong predictors of all three categories of response. It's pretty simple. Americans who understand that climate change is real, that it's human caused, that it's bad for people, not just plants, penguins, and polar bears, um, and that there's hope. This is solvable. This is something we can do something about. Those are four very strong predictors of people who hold these attitudes and who are taking these actions. <laughs>
And there's one other very strong belief. We, we have come to call this a gateway belief because we now understand this to be the most fundamental of all beliefs about climate change, that there is, in fact, a consensus among the experts that human-caused climate change is happening. Americans who have been deceived into thinking otherwise tend not to believe in these other four statements, these other four ideas that global warming is real, human-caused, bad for us, and solvable. So if you will, I see these as five simple messages that have the potential to help those four Americas in the middle of the continuum um, evolve over time to become more like the alarmed. Um, and the reason why it's so important um, from me as a communication scientist, the reason why it's so important for me to identify simple beliefs that are important predictors of, of appropriate attitudes and actions is because simple beliefs are easily turned into simple messages. And simple messages, repeated often by a variety of trusted sources, is what begins to shape public understanding over time. My core training, and for 25 years I worked exclusively in the field of public health, I still am working in the field of public health, I'm just working on a different public health threat, um, but this is something that we've really learned very clearly in the public health field over the past 50 years. We have helped to solve important, whole range of important public health threats in America and around the world by using that formula, simple clear messages repeated often by a variety of trusted voices. Um, I would contend that that fundamentally is our opportunity here. So I urge you to all, if you are not currently receiving our reports, I urge you to come to my, our website, click on the Receive Our Reports link. Um, you'll automatically get our work as we publish it. Um, two final thoughts. One, and I'm, I'm bad, I'm, I should slap my own wrist for forgetting to do this. All of that public understanding data that I showed you at the national level, that's thanks to my colleagues at Yale. We have, they have put up 14 different indicators of public opinion at the state level and at the congressional district level for every congressional district in America. So if you are interested in what your constituents think about these issues, um, go, it's called the Yale Climate Opinion Maps. Just Google that, it will take you right to this incredible interactive mapping tool, and you can see where your constituents fall out on 14 different indicators. Um, and then lastly, I promised uh, in the, in, as, a, as a way to try to get you here, um, I made clear that we're about to do our, our fall survey. The major focus of our upcoming survey will be policy support for a range of different climate and clean energy actions. We are wide open to including policies that you think are promising, that you would like to see move forward on, on Capitol Hill or in state houses around the country. Um, so my offer to you, made in the flyer, but, but I'm, I'm here today to now make good on that offer, is I want to hear your thoughts about the policies that we should assess public support for. Um, so that's it. I now, um, we don't unfortunately have a microphone to pass around to you. Um, so Carol, perhaps you'd be willing to uh, sort of moderate the conversation? Sure. Well, let's just open it up for your questions and if you could identify yourself when you ask your question and uh, we'll, we'll proceed, okay? Um, okay, so we'll start, we'll start in the back. There was, so I thought there was a hand back there. Okay, back here. Okay, we'll start over here. care 
many people aren't taking action. They may feel impotent. They may feel there are no good actions for them to take. What we have learned in our polling research and, and other forms of research is that, that the alarmed segment, so that's 16 percent of the public, um, they are all taking action. Most of them are taking action as consumers. In other words, they're, they're rewarding certain companies that they think are aligning with behind solutions and they're punishing other companies by not, you know, patronizing them because they think those companies are, are the problem. Um, so almost 100% of the alarmed are taking action as consumers. Only slightly more than one out of four, somewhere between 25 and 30%, are taking actions as citizens. So I, there, there's, in other words, there's a fundamental disconnect between the kinds of actions that people take to express their will about a better future. Um, I, I think people take action, are, are more likely to take action as a citizen because they know what to do. That's easy. It's sort of a, a natural byproduct of act decisions they're making on a daily basis. Most Americans don't know how to express themselves as a citizen, and they feel impotent that even if they were to do so, their elected officials wouldn't care one way or the other. Um, when I come to, to offices here on Capitol Hill and I have a chance to speak with staff and members, I hear the exact opposite. I hear how important it is to hear what constituents want the members to do. So it's a really curious disconnect between public understanding about their options to take action um, and what they actually end up doing. I'm doing a year here on the Hill in Senator Sanders' office, um, and she released a report of um, a large survey that she conducted over the past year, or the past summer, in Maryland. Um, and what she found in Maryland um, is comported with what many people and many organizations think is the case. Millennials care more about the issue than do their parents and their grandparents. Um, and the differences were pretty, pretty large. In our national data, we have looked at this a number of different times, starting all the way back in, in, the, um, in 2008, 2009, um, and as recently as this year. Until this year, we didn't see any difference by age group out there among American adults. In other words, millennials don't care, or in our surveys, they don't care more than their parents and their grandparents. The one exception that we found, and only in our most recent survey, which was done in the spring, is that Republican millennials now show that they are, are their answers indicate that they are that they do care more than their parents and their grandparents. Again, this is one survey, one one political demographic in one survey. You know, this could be a promising sign. It could just be a um, a little erroneous blip in our, in our data. But Karen's findings are were very very clear. Um, whether or not. Um, Perhaps Maryland is going to be a, a bellwether for the rest of America. We Marylanders can, can always hope so. What about I'm sorry. Um, yes, women care more about this issue than do men. Um, <laughs> but but you, if, before you feel too self-satisfied, um, they only care a little bit more. Um, of course, we've all heard about the angry white male phenomenon, so the, the dismissive segment in our six Americas, they are predominantly angry white males. Um, but since they're only 10% of America, it, it means that the other groups, that the, the gender distinction, the gender gr um, gradient isn't all that large. But we, we rep the photos we use to represent these groups um, are not an accident. Um, the, the alarmed and the concerned are represented as women because more women are in the alarmed and the concerned segment. Yes, sir. And I want to go to your point that uh, simple messages repeated often from trusted sources uh, can shift opinion. Do you have any data on what sources are trusted 
by the disengaged alpha and dismiss it. I have a feeling it's not the Sierra. Um, it, it, yes, the question is what sources are trusted by the doubtful and dismissive? Um, it's not the Sierra Club? Yes, correct. It's not the Sierra Club. Um, we have that data. You can come to our website and you can find reports on Six Americas reports in which we show the data, um, trust data, in, broken out by the Six Americas. Yes, sir. I just have a question. Has there been any like studies and data that account for income and how they feel towards climate change and their public attitude towards it? Yeah, so the segment that we call the disengaged is the only segment um, that is, you know, really starkly less uh, uh, less economically advantaged. In other words, they are starkly more economically disadvantaged. Um, the two segments on the, the ends, the dis uh, dismissive and the alarmed, are slightly more economically advantaged than the other segments. Um, so on, on one end, yes, we see sort of an income gradient in our data. However, we also see a very clear, um, the, the data are very clear that African Americans care more about this issue than do Caucasians, and Hispanic Americans care more about this issue than do non-Hispanic Americans. Um, so there's something really interesting going on in those two communities, um, and exactly what it is is, I think, an open question, but, but it is, it's a good thing. I'm gonna go to this side of the room, please. American Geoscience Institute Congressional Fellow in Senator Tom Udall's office. Um, and when in more of a communication question, do you notice a difference in response in terms of are do you believe that it is occurring or it is human caused when you alternate between global warming and climate change? Because global warming really implies a certain direction, whereas climate change, as you mentioned, that remains way more complex in, in context. So do you see a change in response depending on which term you use? So, so the question is, does it matter for what word, what name you use, global warming or climate change? Um, you, you had an interesting assumption in your question that the term global warming carries with it the implication of human-caused global warming, where the term climate change doesn't carry that implication. Um, that's a, that is actually, yes, we've learned that to be true. Um, it turns out that most members of the public tell us they find those two terms to be synonyms. They're equally comfortable with both terms. Um, but when we get down to a more sort of subtle, granular analysis, when we ask them to tell us top of mind, what, what comes to mind first when you hear the, the term global warming, and we ask other people what comes to mind first when you hear the term climate change, um, and so by analyzing people's top of mind associations, we find out it's a little different. Differences aren't big. Do you see a difference in like this spectrum in terms of whether they're very concerned or just like not at all concerned? Um, by and large, conservatives are a, a somewhat more comfortable with the term climate change because it doesn't necessarily carry that implication of human cost. It's a great question. Yes, sir. Department of Transportation, could you clarify how you're approaching the presentation of facts? There's questions that seem to be related to the facts, so uh, maybe I was a little confused at the end, but you seem to sort of say that climate change is real and so on, and then you seem also to be surveying people about that question. So, sure, because, uh, right, so the question is, yeah. um, I, I guess the question is, some things are fact-based about global warming, and, and, we're in and we surveyed people about those fact-based um, the, the, those facts. Um, the fact that climate change is real, that it is human-caused, that is already manifesting in communities across America. So we'll, we'll just say that those are three facts as ascertained by the National Climate Assessment. But we know that not all Americans believe that to be so, to believe any, any of all, each of those three things to be so. More Americans believe it's real than believe it's human caused. And, and more Americans believe human caused climate change is happening than understand that it's having an impact across America today. So just because it's fact-based doesn't mean we don't need to, under, to assess public understanding of, of those facts.
And now I understand your question. We don't present them as facts. We only ask questions. So I presented them to you in my preamble as factual, but no, we don't. We, we, work, um, we work as hard as we know how to be completely unbiased and to not lead the witness, so to speak, um, which is why that, that pair of questions that I, I showed you about would you be more or less likely to vote for a candidate who supports climate action and more or less likely to vote for a candidate who opposes climate action, those are perfect parallel questions just adopting the, the opposite point of view. Yes, sir. That looks at the effect of American attitudes and action on climate change on foreign governments, there is any effect? Um, so I'm not sure I understand the question. Do, has anybody assessed public understanding that India and China are starting to engage? have any effect on other governments' willingness to do the same and fall in their point, or does America have any leadership in that realm? On the okay, that, that's a really subtle and interesting question. I, I don't know the answer. The question was, does, does the public understand or does the public believe that American leadership on this issue will bring other nations along? We might be seeing that implicitly in the fact that the majority of Americans feel like we should be doing this regardless, but I don't know if they feel that way in part because they think that leadership is required and we should be leading. Yes, sir. Um, your, in, in any of your blood breakdowns, did you do a geographic analysis? I don't know, you know, when people think of climate change, they often think of rising sea levels, changing weather. So I don't know if some of those effects that are most commonly tangible, like if people in coastal districts have a higher understanding or more alarmism about climate change, I wasn't sure if you had seen anything like that. Um, it, I don't know how to restate that question. Um, I'll just answer the question. It is absolutely true that um, Blue states, people in blue states, which happen along the coast to a great degree, are, are much more convinced that human-caused climate change is, is happening, that it's serious, and they would like to see it solved. Um, that doesn't really address the question, which is, does people's experience with climate impacts um, help to convince them of the, the, the magnitude or the gravity of this threat? Um, Karen, again, referencing Karen Akerlof's research, Karen did a study in um, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan a number of summers ago in which she asked people a pretty simple question. Um, in, in our survey, in her survey, she asked, have you personally experienced global warming? We, we've asked that in a lot of our surveys, and, and we've learned that about a quarter of, of the public in this was now almost eight, ten years ago, about a quarter of the public at that time said, yes, I've personally experienced global warming. Until Karen did her study in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, we didn't know what they meant by that. We didn't know in what ways they felt they had personally experienced global warming. And so Karen asked that question in an open-ended manner. They could just tell us in their own words how they had personally experienced global warming. And then Karen coded those impacts, those perceived personal experiences, and then she looked at the actual climatic record in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan in the preceding three decades. And, and what she found is that four of, three of the four impacts that people mentioned, and they tended to be fairly mundane things, like um, you know heavier rain, uh, I actually I can't, it's been so long since I've looked at that, I can't remember. Um, but the, the point was, they tended to be talking about impacts in their own backyard, not I went to Glacier National Park as a kid and then I took my kid there 30 years later and it was stunning to see the melting of those, you know, the, the, the recession of the glaciers. So people were telling us that they were seeing impacts in their backyard and Karen's research proved that three of the four impacts that they told us they were seeing are in fact clearly in evidence in the climatic record. So it suggests that um, although climate change is a slow-moving phenomenon, it suggests that if, you pay it, if you've been in one place for a while and you're paying enough attention, you might actually notice the changes. No? Stephen? Those who uh, do believe in climate change and are worried about it, is there any sort of data on um, the burden that they're willing to take on? Um, you know, if they uh, would <coughs> certain taxes or you know, they're okay with paying $100, $100 more in taxes per year, 
Yes, so lot, lots of research teams have looked at that. Um, that question, essentially willingness to pay, um, we have looked at it only occasionally. We looked at it in 2010 when there was a possibility that climate legislation would pass on Capitol Hill, and we found that the, the cost of the policy was calculated by the Congressional uh, um, Budget Office at about 50 cents a day, $180 a year for the average family. So we asked willingness to pay, and what we found is that in some instances, support for climate action at the federal level actually increased with that relatively modest price tag. Um, so I'm, I'm not an expert in this, uh, in this issue at all, but I've certainly read lots of studies which show the public is willing to pay. Some people aren't willing to pay anything. Some people are willing to pay a lot. On average, their willingness to pay seems to be pretty well aligned with what some policies you know, are thought to actually cost. Um, so I think I need to c call it quits here. Um, I didn't get any suggestions from you as to policies we should be surveying on. Um, why don't instead, why don't we just, why don't you come and share them with me personally because we are now at the top of the hour and I don't want to overstay my welcome. So if you have policies you want us to pull on, bring them on up. So I want to thank you all very, very much for coming this afternoon. And of course, this will um, uh, be up on EESI's website so that you can uh, make sure that you can forward that information to your friends or colleagues so that this information can be shared. And uh, all of the, the presentation and the discussion will be available that way. And I just want to say thank you very much to Dr. Maybach for being with us this afternoon, helping us better understand a lot of these issues with regard to public opinion. And it's very, very important in terms of thinking about how all of this affects what we do, questions that we have, things that we would like to know more about. So please share with him. Also share with us at EESI in terms of issues that you would like to have looked at, explored, so that we can all try to do a better job. And again, thank you very, very much. And thank you, Professor Maybach.